Greetings all! Since the last talks video was on a US gun, it's only fair to hop over to the other side and look into the development and installation of another famous gun, the German 8.8 into the Tiger. For such a famous weapon and mount, there's a surprising amount of misconception there too. The start point is in the 1920s, and like most good equipment, it was a piece of equipment intended to meet a specific requirement. That requirement was anti-air defense against medium and high-level bombers, defined as between 500 meters to 6 kilometers of altitude and with an 8 kilometer slant range. Time of flight at the maximum altitude and slant was to be no more than 25 seconds. That meant that muzzle velocity had to be plenty fast and the shell heavy enough to maintain that momentum to counter the effect of drag from the air. The smallest caliber capable of meeting those requirements, the Germans figured, was 8.8 centimeters. Remember, smaller caliber equals lighter weight and higher rate of fire. There is something of a debate in the anti-aircraft world as to whether you want a large caliber for a bigger bursting charge or a smaller caliber for more rounds fired. Uh, but that's the way the Germans went at the time. They figured that anything bigger than an 8.8 .8 wouldn't be particularly mobile and would have to be on rail or static mounts. Generally speaking, the projectile and cartridge case would have been taken from the Navy's L45 8.8 .8 to save on development and production expense. In any case, the cunningly named Flak 18 started getting delivered to the troops around 1934. I'm not quite sure what they were attempting to gain by the naming of a Flak 18. I mean, I can't imagine that folks who suddenly notice a thousand AA guns of a type unknown before the mid-1930s suddenly appearing in service might be fooled by a name implying that they were designed really two decades prior. Minor improvements, mainly to the fire control system and barrel, followed in the Flak 36 and Flak 37. And this was not intended to be a dual-purpose weapon per se, but the concept of using it against terrestrial enemies was planned for. As a result, two fuses were requested for the shell, a timed fuse for anti-aircraft work and a contact fuse for ground targets. After all, even air defense guns might find themselves subject to a direct attack. As fate would have it though, when the 8.8s were sent to Spain, it turned out that no matter what the doctrinal intent was, the guns found themselves shooting at ground targets a lot more than at aircraft. There was this myth that Rommel himself invented the use of the 8.8 .8 as an anti-tank gun when faced with British infantry tanks at Arras. Not so. The use of the 8.8 .8 in the anti-tank rule goes back a couple of years prior to that. The first use is indeed in Spain. The German army at the time was giving no consideration to the 8.8 .8 in the anti-tank rule. The gun is just huge. I mean, for anti-tank purposes, you want something small that's easy to hide, easy to pull out of position and relocate. Now, if you've got to go with an AA gun, maybe the 2 centimeter or the 3.7 centimeter. After all, for the 1930s, with AP rounds, those would be quite capable against pretty much anything in service anywhere. The 8.8 .8 was just plain unsuitable. However, doctrine or not, that did not stop the 8.8 .8 gunners in Spain shooting at tanks anyway when and they happened to be around. And well, the fact that they had no armor piercing round wasn't really much of a problem. After all, when the opposition is no more heavily armored than a T26 or a BT5, and you are firing a 9 kilogram HE shell with a contact fuse at 840 meters a second, you probably don't really need an AP round. Still, precedent was now set. Three further developments came about. One was the creation of an armor piercing round. The primary target for this would actually be fortifications. Of all the various mobile weapons out there in the German army, the 8.8 .8 seemed to be the most capable against hard targets like bunkers. The second was the creation of an armored shield to protect the gun crew. If they're shooting at ground targets, it is possible that the ground target might decide to shoot back. The third was a modification to the sighting telescope that elevation can now be implied in terms of meters of range and not sixteenths of a degree. After all, if the primary purpose of the gun now was to be shooting at ground targets, the use of the more complicated anti-aircraft aiming system which required a conversion table was probably not ideal. So now we have an 8.8 .8 centimeter gun designed primarily with ground targets in mind. 
It's still, in nomenclature system, a FLAC-18, not a PAC anti-tank gun, but it's designed to be set up quickly and used in direct fire. Unsurprisingly, and inevitably, especially with more attention being paid to French tanks, these systems were assigned to Panzerjäger, or tank hunter units, in heavy companies. Most of them were towed guns, but there was a self-propelled unit. They saw service in Poland and France, so by the time Rommel's lads received the attentions of British armor, the idea of using the 8.8 as an AT gun was already very well established. But that is just the gun. How did it end up being put into Tiger? Not for that. You have to look at Tiger's design requirements, and you realize that the reason the Tiger ended up as it was turned out to be as much fate as it was deliberate planning. Around 1935, there was thought put out to a heavily armored vehicle which could take on the big French tanks which looked like being adopted. Unfortunately, at the time, they were looking for about a 30-ton weight limit, which meant that they could either have armor or they could have a big gun. It didn't seem likely that both were possible at the same time. Indeed, by late 1938, they had concluded that the armor was more important. This new, heavy, 30-ton tank, given the name Der Bruchwagen, or Breach Vehicle, puts the intent directly in its name. The gun was to be the same short 7.5 centimeter as found on Panzer IV. It was more important that the tank be able to take hits than to kill tanks. This would become the VK30.01 design. There was certainly some thought that perhaps a bigger gun would be nice to have, but the options turned out to be limited. About the only reasonable alternative would be the long 5 centimeter gun. The 7.5 cm L34.5, or later L43, both would have required a lot of work to be even able to mechanically fit into the turret, and it wasn't going to be very comfortable for the crew once it was done. In the end, the turrets ended up being sent for use as fortifications, so US troops did technically engage the VK30.01 project as, of two turrets present, one was operational at Omaha Beach. In the meantime, the Germans decided that they wanted to upgun the VK-30 to a 10.5 cm gun, making it in effect an artillery wagon. This would become the VK-36.01, which, despite the name, would actually come in at some 40 tons when fully combat loaded. Now, in the meantime, Porsche had been doing some development work of his own. He also took a crack at the VK30.01 requirement with a short 7.5 or 10.5. However, in March of 1941, Krupp comes along and offers Porsche the possibility of creating a turret capable of carrying an 8.8 .8 or even 10.5 centimeter high velocity cannon. Quite how this was supposed to fit and still weigh, uh, remain within the weight limit is not stated, but the offer was put out there. Happy enough to try, Porsche went along with the idea. Then Hitler got involved. In late May 1941, he decreed that armor-piercing punch was more important, and the ideal gun for that would be the 7.5 centimeter Waffe 0725. It's a squeeze board gun. Subject, of course, to there being sufficient tungsten available to equip the tanks with enough ammunition. As an alternative, the Porsche design could keep the 8.8 centimeter KWK L56. There was a brief discussion of the FLAC-41 gun, but that got shot down as unrealistic. Thus, it was decided that the 8.8cm turret we are familiar with as a Tiger turret was manufactured by Krupp and sent to Porsche for installation on its electrically driven Type 101. Contracts for 100 units of the Porsche design, which seemed to show some promise, followed quickly in late July 1941. At the same time, orders were placed with Krupp for three additional 8.8 cm turrets, except configured for hydraulic, not electric drive, for trials on the Henschel chassis. However, this turret design did not meet with the approval of the head of the Army's Vehicle Design Board. He hoped a better one could be made. He gave the task to Rheinmetall, who was also working on the problem of creating a gun capable of penetrating 140 mm of armor at a kilometer or for the Tiger project, 100 millimeters sloped at 30 degrees at 1,400 meters. 
Eventually, this gun would become the KWK-42 as found on Panther, but a turret was designed for it to be mounted on Tiger. This design being the Panzerkampfwagen 6 H Ausführung H2. The advantage of the smaller caliber was that the turret overall was lighter, better balance, and more ammunition could be carried. By early March 1942, this had become the official standard of the Tiger I. The first 100 vehicles already contracted for would come with those 8.8cm turrets from Krupp kicked over from the failed Porsche design after conversion to hydraulic drive. Everything after that, I tank number 101 onwards, would have the long 7.5cm cannon and turret, starting production around February of 1943. This plan lasted until about mid-July 42 before it changed again. Two things happened. Firstly, the 8.8 L71 looked like it was going to come online as a tank gun by the end of the year, and it was intended to place that into Tiger. Secondly, the 8.8cm AP round fired from the L56 was modified in order to increase its penetration capability by increasing the amount of metal and decreasing the size of the bursting charge. This then meant two more things. Firstly, that the L56 8.8 could meet the current required armor piercing performance capabilities. And secondly, it was all a little bit daft to build 100 short 8.8 .8 turrets, which met minimum standards, convert for a few months to 7.5 centimeter turrets with slightly better overall capability, and then convert again a few months after that to building 8.8-71 tanks. As a result, the Tiger H H2 idea was abandoned, and all Tigers were built with the 8.8 centimeter gun. When it came to the long 8.8, .8, Porsche, again, were ahead of the game. In February of 1942, they put in another request with Krupp for another 100 turrets, this with the 8.871. The idea was that after the first 100 Porsche Tigers had been successfully built and sent off into glorious combat for the Vaterland, the next 100 would have this longer gun. Krupp set about designing this turret for Porsche. It has ever since then been known as the Porsche turret. Initially, the hull was going to be similar to Tiger One, but changing requirements to include a realization that guns had improved a little bit in the last two years meant that an entirely new hull design was going to be needed as well. The discussion of hull design is well, probably a little bit outside of the frame of reference here, but suffice to say that though initially the idea for Henschel was going to be just a sloped armor Tiger One hull with a new Krupp turret on top, a few more change requirements, such as parts commonality with the Panther II, resulted in the new Henschel 8.871 Tiger hull being a fair bit different from its ancestor. By November of 1942, it was clear that Porsche was a bad bet for future Tiger production, and the 50 turrets made were converted, like their predecessors, from electric to hydraulic drive, and then plonked on top of Henschel hulls. In the meantime, Krupp had troubleshot a few problems with the turret, such as grinding the 8 cm thick curved plates with a hand tool to make them fit is a little bit intolerable. And thus, Krupp created the series production turret, which was only ever going to be mounted on the Henschel chassis, thus giving us the name of the Henschel turret. So there you go, the story of how the 8.8 cm went from being an anti-aircraft gun to an anti-tank gun, to a gun which an overambitious vehicle designer wanted to stick into a tank, to one which Hitler himself laid out a preference for, and ending up being one of the most feared weapons of World War II when mounted on a large breakthrough tank. Hope you found that interesting and informative. I'm Nicholas Morin, the Chieftain, and I will talk to you on the next one. Take care.